Welcome to section 16.11. Okay, gentle people, what I want to discuss right now is something called the phase change diagram. Now to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have pressure on my y-axis and temperature on my x-axis. Now I'm going to construct this using the vapor pressures of solids and liquids. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to label my phase change diagram point A, B, C, and D. Now what you guys will see is that this line segment from A to B is going to be based off of the solids vapor pressure. And so what you can see is that there's solid described above this line and then gas is described below this line. So section AB, we're going to go ahead and write that this is the solids vapor pressure. Now the next section that we're going to talk about is section B to C, which is right here. Now you can see that above this line we have liquid and below this line we have the gas. So this line, the way we get this, is we're actually looking at the liquid's vapor pressure. So I'm going to write that down for you, BC. And then lastly, we have the segment BD, which is this line between my solid and my liquid. Well, that is going to be defined by where the solid's vapor pressure equals the liquid's vapor pressure. So when these two equal each other, that is going to form that line segment BD. Now that we've told you how this phase diagram is constructed, let's see why this diagram is useful to us. So what this diagram is telling us is it is going to tell us the thermodynamically most stable phase given a pressure and a temperature. So if I were to give you this point in this graph right there, at that pressure and that temperature, well, that tells me that the solid phase is the most thermodynamically most favorable. Now, what I can also do is I can have point one and then I can have point two. And if I were to try to go from point one to point two, any line that I cross, it will go ahead and tell me what phase change I'm going to have. So in this case, I'm going from a solid to a liquid. So a solid to a liquid is the melting process. If I were to go from point two to point three, well, I can see what borders I cross. And what you guys will see is I cross that barrier between the liquid and the gas. And so that is going to be vaporization. So this is to remind you what all the phase changes are called. And so this diagram will tell you what phase changes will occur once you go from one single point in this graph to another point on this graph. Now what this graph can also tell us is the effects of pressure has on a certain phase change. So let's go ahead and see how pressure affects the boiling point. Now this is something that we've already discussed, but let's see if this diagram confirms what we talked about before. Let's say that I'm at this pressure, pressure A. And if I want to look at pressure A and I want to know what the, and if I want to see where the boiling point is, I can go across and see where I cross the liquid gas barrier. And then if I drop down, that will tell me the temperature that I will boil at at pressure A. Now, if I were to increase the pressure, to let's say some pressure right here, and let's call that B, I can see the new boiling point at pressure B. And so this would be the temperature where I would boil at B. Now, if I go ahead and take a look at this, what I see is as I increase the pressure, the temperature at which it boils is going to be higher. Now, this is something that we've discussed before, but it also gives us insight into some cooking devices you may have in your kitchen, namely the pressure cooker. What you guys will notice is that when you use a pressure cooker, what you're doing is you're cooking in a semi-sealed container. 
What you're trying to do is you're trying to boil water and if you put it into a pressure cooker, the pressure inside that pot is a lot higher. So the water doesn't boil unless you heat it up to a really hot temperature. So instead of wasting energy into boiling water, you're putting that energy into cooking your food. And that's why things cook a lot faster using a pressure cooker. Another way to think about this is you guys can think that the more pressure you have, the more you are squishing that liquid together. Now, if you're squishing that liquid together, it's harder for those molecules to fly away. And thus, you are going to have to give those molecules more and more energy to fly away to become vapor, thus raising the boiling point. Now, let's take a look at the effects of pressure on the melting point. So I've got two graphs for you. So I'm going to do the same thing I did on that last slide. I'm going to pick point A. I'm going to go ahead and cross that solid liquid barrier. And I'm going to drop down to see what temperature I am to see where my melting point is going to be. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase my pressure to point B. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go across and then I'm going to drop down. Now what you guys see in this first graph is that if I go ahead and increase the pressure, well the temperature at which sub the substance melts is going to be at a much higher temperature. Now that's true for the graph on the left, but let's take a look at what happens with water. So same deal before, on water, this graph on the right, I'm going to pick pressure A, I'm going to see where I cross the solid liquid barrier, I'm going to drop down to get a certain temperature. I'm going to increase the pressure and then I'm going to go to point B. I'm going to see where I cross the line. And what you guys will see is I get the opposite effect with water. For water, if I were to increase the pressure, well, my melting point would go down. Now, this is kind of unique to water, and water behaves in a very strange way. Generally speaking, the higher the pressure is, the higher my melting point is going to be. And this is an important exception with water. Now, what we can do is we can do another kind of analysis in the uniqueness of water. So again, let's go ahead and start off with this graph on the left-hand side which is the phase change diagram that most substances have. What I'm going to do is start at a single temperature and increase the pressure. And I want to see what borders I cross. If I start to increase the pressure, I cross the gas liquid barrier. And then finally, I cross the liquid solid barrier. So at this particular temperature, what's going to happen is I'm going to go from the gas to a liquid to a solid. Now, this should make sense to you. If I'm increasing the pressure, I'm squishing down on my material. And a gas, our particles far apart. Liquid, they get closer together. And then solids tend to be the most dense state of most materials. And so I finally squish my liquid down and I make it a solid, the most dense phase of that particular material. Now, water, on the other hand, behaves differently. So again, I'm going to start at a certain temperature and I'm going to just increase the pressure and look at what borders I cross in what order. Now for water, what I see is that I start as a gas, I compress that gas to a solid, and then finally, if I compress that solid enough, I will get to the liquid phase. Now what this is saying is that if I squish and squish down on water, eventually I will get to a liquid. And the reason this happens is that it turns out that the liquid is more dense than the solid. So this is part of the reason why water's phase diagram is so special and so unique. It is this kind of thing that you guys are probably used to, but this doesn't happen in typical materials. And what you see in this picture is you see a piece of ice or solid water float on top of liquid water. Now, most materials, when you make it a solid, they would sink to the bottom of their liquid phase because the solid is more dense. Now, water is unique 
in that when you start freezing water, the intermolecular forces take over and the hydrogen bonds force water into a special structure. This special structure takes up more volume than if it was a liquid. And that is why the liquid water is more dense than the solid phase of water. Let's talk about some other interesting points on our phase diagram. One thing is the intersection of all the line segments we have in this single point right here. This is called the triple point. At the triple point, solid, liquid, and gas are all in equilibrium and they all exist. Now this point is a particular point in every piece of material. It is at a specific temperature and a specific pressure when you talk about a chemical compound. The other point that is special on my phase diagram is this one found at the end of the liquid gas border or the liquid gas segment. This point right here is the abrupt stop of this line segment right here, and this is called the critical point. At the critical point, this is where I stop having a discernible difference between liquid and gas. Above this point and to the right of this point, what I have is something called a supercritical fluid. A supercritical fluid is something that is in between the liquid and gas phase. These two phases kind of blur together and it is indiscernible to say if this is really a liquid or this is a gas. And so this is a special place on our phase diagram. Now phase diagrams can get super complicated. You can have different solid phases. So if you guys remember in Chem 1B, uh, carbon had two solid phases, diamond and graphite. So here is the phase diagram of carbon. And so this will tell you what is the most stable phase. Now what you guys will notice that if you increase the pressure of pencil lead, what you will eventually come across is a place where diamonds are more thermodynamically more favorable. So with that said, let's go ahead and finish off this section with a small little quiz. Using this phase diagram, go ahead and answer what is the normal boiling point of this substance. All right, gentle people, if I'm interested in the normal boiling point, what I want to do is I want to go from a liquid to a gas. So my suggestion to you people is that you first go ahead and label the regions on your phase diagram. So solids will always be the leftmost and topmost, liquids are somewhere in the middle, and then gases will always be the bottom right. Now what we want to cross is this line segment between the liquid and gas phases. And so I want the normal boiling point which means I want to cross that line at 1 atm. So I'll start at 1 atm, go across, and then I will drop down, and I will see that this is going to occur about 40 degrees Celsius. So that is going to be our answer. I hope that made sense, and stay safe, Chem1C.